Hello everyone and welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Marika Audsley. I'm Ellie. And I'm Fabs. We are the founders of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. A few housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them out in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will read them out for you. Bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us and importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So just as a brief introduction for our guest today, Marika is an acclaimed theatre director. She has directed critically praised productions of Julius Caesar for the Royal Shakespeare Company and Slight and Hand by Chris Bush. After graduating from Cambridge, Marika trained at Birkbeck on the theatre training MFA. She has directed at the Arcola Theatre as well as directing a wide variety of Shakespeare's work works. We are honoured to have this Cambridge alumna and talented director speak. So Marika, my first question for you is when did you know that you wanted to be a director or work in theatre? Oh I think I knew I wanted to work in theatre when I was really small just because I loved performing when I was young and I did um, National Youth Theatre and loads of drama at school and I was always yeah desperate to be in school plays and do all of that so I sort of that was always a big part of my life. And then I arrived at Cambridge and I started off acting in shows. And then at the end of my first year, I directed my first play. And I thought, okay, yeah, this is really, this is really great. This is better than acting, I think. And then at the end of my second year, I directed um, cast. I did uh, Henry V. And, you know, it was just the best, it was just the best thing. There I was with my pals doing Shakespeare, um, traveling to America, having this amazing time. And I thought, maybe, if, maybe I should try and do this for real. I have never done anything as glamorous as the cast American <laughs> stage tour, <laughs> because that was the, you know, going, going flying to Florida and performing in all these places that <laughs> nowhere has yet, has yet been as glam. Um, <laughs> but I think it was that, it was that, it was really that time and it was working on Shakespeare with, um, with a bunch of people I really liked. Um, and I thought this, this could be, could be a fun way forward. If I can get away with doing this as a real job where I'm having fun making shows with, um, with interesting people, then I'm going to give that a shot. And so that's, um, that was it really. It was just always passion. There was never any sensible decision-making process that went, went into it. That seems to be the way to go. Um, so you were very involved in theatre at your time in Cambridge. So did you sort of get involved straight from the get-go from Freshers Plays and everything? I did, yeah. I actually, um, so my uh, my dad works in the film industry and he, somebody, he'd worked with a, a fantastic uh, film producer, Tanya Sagutchin, um, who was a, being assisted at the time by... Uh, uh, John Croker, who is a who's writer, who was one of his writing credits. Uh, most famous now is um, the Paddington movies, but he's done lots of other stuff. And um, and my dad knew that they had both been to Cambridge and they'd done lots of drama. Uh, and he said, "Well, maybe do you want to drop them a, a line and see if they'd be up for having a cup of tea, and they can give you some tips." So um, we went to have a cup of coffee, and they said, "Right, this is how it works. Get on the actors <laughs> list. You know all the things." And even though they'd left quite a long time before I was then arriving it was still exactly the same system and I imagine the ABC actors list is where all the auditions are posted um, so I arrived already knowing how to sort of hunt down the auditions and things so immediately I signed up and I think I ditched I ditched all the freshers events at Homerton and I just was like cycling around town auditioning for absolutely everything um, <laughs> because I was so desperate to get, to get straight in there. Um, and, and then luckily uh, I did, I got, I got, I was over two, but I, I did, um, I was in a production of Abigail's Party at the Corpus Playroom and I did an ADC show. I did, we did the Crucible in the Round Church, but before it, I don't know if it's still used quite a lot for theatre stuff, but I think we were one of the first plays. Um, so it felt quite exciting. Um, oh, we're in the Round Church. Um, and so, yeah, that sort of happened, that happened for me really quickly, but because I I sort of knew that I was really wanting to sort of hunt that down. And then, and then once you're kind of 
you start, then you've kind of got the bug really. And... Yeah, definitely. That sounds amazing doing the crucible in a church would be amazing. It was, um, but... it was really, actually, and it was funny enough directed by the now unbelievably famous James Norton um, before oh, wow. he was uh, <laughs> before he was famous. Um, so that was kind of a mate. That was sort of. It's funny if you look back now. Uh, you know, we've now been graduated for quite a long time, and and uh, I found my card, which was a picture, you know, end of the run card, which was a photo of all of us who were involved. And there's quite a few people in there who were um, who were still in the who were in the industry, um, but nobody more famous than James Norton. I think James is the <laughs> he's the most famous. Very um, cool. Um, how well do you feel like your time at Cambridge, or even your degree? I said you studied English, correct? Um, prepared you for your future career? Oh, really well, actually. I mean, main, I think it's a combination of things. I think um, just the opportunity, like it was just, I think, God, we were so, how lucky were we to have all those theatres and to be a, and have so many people who were interested in getting involved, either acting or lighting your show or designing it and stage managing it. So all of that creativity and all that passion and also because you don't have much time, you've just got to have an awful lot of kind of gumption and just go, it's going to be under rehearsed, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the show will go on. Um, and so the opportunity to just try loads of stuff, they're not, I mean, that it feels like there's pressure, but there's not really that much pressure. You know, nobody's losing thousands of thousands of pounds and um, in investment. Um, and so being able to, just experiment and and try things out was amazing and, and and just get a lot of experience that way and then in terms of the degree you know or if with english certainly all the all the kind of closed textual stuff um all of that analysis i use a great deal still in m my work on shakespeare um and translating it from a sort of trying to go from that academic analysis to how can i now translate this into something practical with uh, work with my actors so that's um, a, a great overlap and then also I think just in terms of essays you know having to have an opinion on something having to go right I'm, I've read loads of stuff and I'm now going to have to pick an argument when you're directing you've got to have a point of view and a perspective and something you want to say so you you get used to just sort of going right I've read all this and I've done all my research and now what's my point of view and how do I pitch that against what other people have said or other people have done so I think they work really well. I think they work really well together. And I wouldn't say either is essential, but it was great, certainly just, just being able to do loads. And, and I realized when I got when I got to doing my masters, friends from my masters who had been at universities where there hadn't been as many opportunities to stage their own work, um, they you know, they hadn't sort of uh, yeah, they hadn't had that that opportunity, and so I think we're so you're so lucky. <laughs> um, and, and now I look back and I think, oh my goodness, I don't think I, I really realised how um, how formative that was, and and how amazing that was. And also just to do loads of it to work out if you like doing it or not. It's not an abstract idea. You've done it a lot, so so you know whether that's it's for you or not. So that's also a really great thing. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, and how did you go about getting into the industry? Was it tied up to your master's at Birkbeck? Sort of what was your first job out of that? Yeah, it was actually. The Birkbeck course is incredible. And I sort of, anybody who is considering going into the industry as a theatre director, I'd say apply for that course because it's just fantastic. Um, it's fantastic for all sorts of reasons, but uh, one of the best things about it is the second year of it, it's a two year master's you get sent to be a resident assistant director in a regional theatre. Yeah. Um, or actually some are in London, some people are in London, but I was in, I went to the, Sheff, uh, the Crucible in Sheffield. So you get this fantastic year where you're actually assisting on professional shows. You're not paid because you're a student, but you then start to build up experience on your CV. And I, one of the reasons why I wanted to go to the Crucible, they do a lot of big classic work. So I then had a Shakespeare in it. Um, I had what did I do I did a new play actually Lungs which is now at the um on at the old Vic with Claire Foy and Matt Smith I, I assisted on the original production of that um Ooh. but the big shows were Othello and The Way of the World so I did I worked on those which meant then when I left I wrote to the RSC and said I see your 
about to stage this very obscure Thomas Middleton play. I love that very obscure Thomas Middleton play and I um, would love to uh, be the assistant if you're looking for somebody. And I have experience of working on big classic plays as an assistant director. Um, so ridiculously, um, my first job was as an assistant at the RSE, which um, I was very uh, lucky. I sort of, look, I don't think, usually now they ask, they sort of want you to have done a bit more. I think I managed to sort of slip through the, <laughs> slip through the net somehow. Um, but then I, I worked on a production of the RSC directed by a director called Sean Foley, who now is the artistic director of Birmingham Rep. And then Sean employed me on his next show. So, it, so and then actually he employed me a few times. Um, it's very good to me. So I, I then had a few jobs that then sort of followed on from that so you just kind of yeah once you get one thing you just need to get like one thing to get going and then you meet more people or somebody might employ you again so it's just getting that first that first hook but the training was instrumental in that really yeah amazing sounds incredible um and just sort of finally for me do you have any advice that you would give to students who want to follow in your footsteps Ooh, i'd say apply to Birkbeck that's the <laughs> apply to Birkbeck i think if you're really serious um yeah, tr invest in it because it's anybody can say I'm a theatre director. You don't have to have training. It's not like, you know, being a doctor or something where you have, you have to learn how to do it. Um, but it will just give you an enormous amount of, it will give you a huge toolbox. It'll expose you to um, ways of working you won't have ever considered. You'll meet lots of interesting people. Um, and you'll have more confidence in yourself at going, no, I deserve, I, I deserve to lead this room as a director because I have, I've learned how to do it rather than I'm just making this all up on the spot, which was definitely what I was doing before I did my training. Um, so I think if you're really serious, train. And if you're uh, also, if you're really serious, um, find something else you can do when you're not directing because nobody works 12 months of the year as a director, unless you're running a building. Um, so you need to invest in yourself to make it a sustainable career and find some things to plug the gaps. So that's, yeah, that's the other thing that's very important to do. That's really, really good advice. Um, going back to your cast, um, which is for anyone listening, Cambridge University's American stage tour, um, you picked Henry V. What, what made you pick Henry V? I I think it was because, well, I was very aware of the restrictions we would have in terms of what we could take with us and how many actors we could have. And that opening speech of the chorus in Henry V is just the most sort of theatrical thing, just excuses. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we don't have everything. You're going to have to make do, do with, with what we've got, essentially. So I thought that was a perfect framework for a tour show and it also has a little bit of everything which I love about Henry V it's sort of an action play with a bit of romance with some great speeches with some comedy which always really appeals to me so it just yeah it, it had a bit of yeah it had a, a bit of everything and I also knowing that we were going to America and how we go, well, if we're going to be Brits doing Shakespeare, let's do a really British, let's do something that feels like a really, really British play. Um, uh, and, and they respond, they did respond very well to, to, to that. That was sort of, that was, I think, fun um, aspect to it. Not, I mean, all of the plays were brilliant and I'm sure would work well, but um, at the time that felt like a really nice marriage of different, different things. Um, but primarily I loved, I loved the play and I thought this will work. Um, because that opening speech gives us permission to. So mm. that was my. Like you touched upon the Britishness of the play. How did you adapt it, Shakespeare, to an American audience? Were there certain things that you bore in mind? Um, I think it's just, and I think this is the thing always with Shakespeare, you just have to make it, the storytelling, as clear as possible. And it makes me really cross when people talk about translating Shakespeare because it's not a different, you know, the language, it's not a different language, it's our language. Um, but you, you need to really get to grip, like what is actually going, what's actually going on. I think sometimes people get caught up in, oh, lovely poetic language. Um, and 
often when I'm directing actors, particularly student actors at drama schools, I'll just keep going, well, what is actually going on in this scene? And, and someone will go, well, uh, I think they're trying to chat that person up. And you go, well, great, that's what you're doing. You know, they're, they're trying to chat them up. So now you need to do that with Shakespeare's language. And once you've realized what the characters are actually doing and you employ the language to facilitate that rather than just, I'm standing here delivering some beautiful poetry, then you make it actually clear. You can see uh, what's going on with sort of human, human beings in the, in the play. Um, so making it yeah making it clear and then or because you always have to assume or i think you have to assume that there'll be people in the audience who don't know the play who've never seen it never read it so and i don't want them to be bored or confused because that's a horrible feeling when you're watching something um and then also we did have a lot of fun this is just because i like this as well trying to make things really physical so we had some great battle sequences and some with the comedy with the leak um stuff if anybody knows the play with Flo Ellen just we had a lot of fun with making it visually interesting as well so if anybody thought oh, I just my ears need to tune out for a little bit um I can just watch this and enjoy the kind of visual aspects so but that's something I do all, all that's something I continue with in all of the Shakespeare I'd say that I do not specifically just if it's an American audience yeah. just, that's but, yeah, what appeals. Were there any particular highlights from the tour that you have kept with you? Oh, do you know, it was all just great. Like, it was all just <laughs> great. It was all brilliant. I think um, it's the people, it's the, it's the people, some of the people that were in it are still my best friends. And I think um, because we had this sort of mad experience together and the places that we saw, I, you know, we went to places that I never would go to you you wouldn't sort of end up going on holiday because it was a sort of between place between other places so you know, random motels off motorways sort of five hours from the nearest town and sort of seeing things that um yeah that wouldn't you wouldn't normally kind of seek out was was incredible so um yeah all all of it really <laughs> was great. yeah it sounds so incredible it's amazing um and so while you said that obviously translating Shakespeare is the wrong way to kind of approach the text. Obviously it does have to be adapted. And how far do you think that we can push those boundaries and how do you personally approach adapting Shakespeare? Yeah, good question. Well, I love to cut, I love to cut, I cut a lot. Um, you know, nobody came out of a Shakespeare and went, that was too short, ever. <laughs> <laughs> so until that gets to that point, I think cut, cut, cut. Um, but cutting also makes you really disciplined about what do you want to say? What do, what's your production? What do you want your production to say? Um, what are you interested in in this production? So I cut, what else do I do? I reassign lines occasionally if I've got, um, if I don't have enough actors or I merge, sometimes I merge character, minor characters together if I know I'm not going to have enough actors. I don't change words some people do that I know Nick Heitner did it with all with gender um uh when he sort of changes the gender assigned gender in the original to how he's casting it which I don't think I've done on the whole because I sort of yeah it depends on that I'm trying to think now sometimes I sort of draw attention to the gender change and sometimes I don't according to the play um but if i don't make words i don't go oh this will be difficult to understand let's change it because i think it's the actor's job and your job to make the manner in which the actor says the word or uses the word should give the audience an understanding of what it it means and shakespeare made up so many words his original audience would have had those a lot of those words for the first time so i feel like it's our it's an easy uh, get out if you just go oh well people won't understand this song you're going to change something else um so yeah i don't tend to do that but i do but i think yeah get the scissors out for sure fair enough um you've written on the rsc blog about wishing that you could time travel back into the context of the plays you know when they were written so that you can understand more fully you know motivations or just sort of cultural context um how does this translate into coming to you know put the play together 
I just, uh, I love, I tend to do play set in the past. I'm more drawn to um, the past than the present because I feel like with, you know, when you do shows, you can kind of open doors on different worlds and, yeah. um, and I just try to, I do as much research as I possibly can when I'm preparing because I think they might, you might just find a little gem that you can then translate into your uh, production or find something really practical that the actors can connect to. So often things like money and food are really good. Um, so when I did, when I was researching, when I was the assistant on Othello, I actually managed to find somewhere in the British Library old pay structures for the army, sort of during the Renaissance, it was sort of, and I found out that, um, how much everybody would have been paid. So when Iago's passed up for promotion, I found out exactly how much money that would have meant that he missed out on. So then you can give the actor a really concrete thing and you go, yeah, and then you find out how much that would be equivalent to now. And then the actor can go, yeah, I would be really pissed off if I missed <laughs> out on that. Um, or if you look at, say, restoration um, plays and everybody speaks in these really, really long sentences and it's all very grand and flowery and... Uh, and then you look up what people were eating and drinking and you think, well, no wonder, because they were pissed all the time because drinking water wasn't safe enough to drink. So if you woke up and you started drinking ale at 8.30 in the morning, you are probably going to be speaking in this way that's really outrageous and flamboyant because everybody's drunk. Um, so you, as much as kind of helping you aesthetically come up with an idea for the design with your designers it's those it's those little um human things that, that are embedded in the world of the play um that you can bring in so that's just really fun and and it just sort of satisfies my own curiosity really lots of it i won't use i just thought that's interesting um and that's fun um but then you might come across something that you can pull out of line during rehearsals and your actors are all really impressed and they go yeah that's great i'll use that so it just yeah varies that's fascinating yeah, amazing research to do. Um, with writers such as Shakespeare who cover such a wide range of genres, do you find that you are sort of drawn to particular ones? You seem to tend to direct history plays or or tragedies. Do you, do you feel like you shy away from comedies for a particular reason? Or Oh, do you know, actually, I funny enough, I do more comedy. I think I've definitely done, yeah, I've, Caesar, sure, is not obviously not a comedy, although there are funny bits in Caesar. Mm. Caesar. Um, I actually tend to lean more towards, I tend to lean more towards comedies. So um, recently I did a product Much Ado and uh, Two Gents last year. I say that also, I've done Richard II as well. Um, and I'm going to be doing Measure at a drama school in the, in September, if it all, if we're allowed to, to get together and do that. So um, I think the thing with Shakespeare, I haven't gone for any of the big tragedies I yet I, I probably will one day um but at the, certainly over the last 10 years I've been more drawn to co comedy um and the great thing about Shakespeare's plays is there's there's sort of usually a bit of everything in in everything but on the whole yeah I've sort of or just the really dramatic juicy just really dramatic juicy I mean they're all big and dramatic and juicy but it, it's sort of different things kind of come in that so I was desperate to do measure because of sort of, I know, I mean, we're still, it's a bit delayed from, you know, me too, but I sort of still feel a lot of those things about who has power and who we listen to um, and who we believe and who makes decisions and how power is handed on. That's still really, really pressing important stuff. So uh, I've been really keen to do that for a while and I finally got the opportunity to do it. So um, that's sort of, yeah, what's happening there is the thing. Cool. Looking to the future a bit then, is there any Shakespeare play that you really want to do and like a creative team that you'd like to do it with? Oh, I mean, I want, sort of want to do them all. <laughs> I kind of want to do them all. Um, oh, I try and think the sort of, well, yeah, Measure's the next, Measure is the next one. I mean, my, my, my favourite of all of them is Macbeth. I am absolutely desperate to do Macbeth. Um, and... 
yeah, there are a few people, but I sort of don't want to say too many sort of names in, <laughs> in case I sort of <laughs> either offend somebody I didn't choose or, or in terms of a design team. Um, but it, that's definitely, it's definitely on the, it's definitely on the list. I, I would really, really love to do that, which definitely isn't a comedy, definitely isn't a comedy, um, but just uh, was the first Shakespeare I really engaged with when I was a teenager and I was in a, an Edinburgh Fringe production of, um, of the Marowitz Macbeth which is um, an adaptation and that's when I fell in love with Shakespeare and and so I'd love to now as an adult go back and, and look at the play look at the play again so that that would be definitely on the list. I also really love Macbeth um... You've directed many plays with emerging actors at theatre schools. Do you find it brings a freshness to looking at Shakespeare? Yeah, I do. I mean, what I love, I, I, um, I love about doing Shakespeare in drama schools is that often you might find you're working with actors where it's their first, it's their first practical exploration of Shakespeare. Maybe they studied, uh, if they did English at school and they had to do a bit of Shakespeare, it might be the first Shakespeare they're in. And I love taking people on a journey where they usually people are absolutely terrified and they're intimidated if they're in first year of drama school. Like, oh goodness, um, this is big, you know, this is sort of big and Shakespeare's sort of difficult and challenging. Um, but it can be so rewarding. It demands so much of you on a um, sort of technical level in terms of voice and movement, but also imaginatively as well. But because it demands more of you, I think you get more back. And that's what I find when I'm doing directing the plays, certainly. So it's great with young training actors, seeing them suddenly, if they've been scared, then go, oh, no, I've got, this is great. This feels really, really good. This is really exciting. Um, so that's definitely, yeah, it's really fun. And just, I mean, all the brilliant thing about working with actors and different actors all the time is everybody's got their own perspective on on things and characters and plays and so there's always an interesting stimulating discussion or approach um but i think that's the nice thing about drama schools is sort of yeah when you when you go and people go oh, i'm kind of scared or i hated to take to at school or i think it's boring and and then at the end they're complete converts and they go no this is great i only want to do shakespeare so that's um that's really fun mm. Going from directing sort of Shakespeare to like a modern text, do you find that there's a main difference between the two um, when you're teaching people, not teaching, but directing people? Yeah. Um, it's funny. Yes and, yes and no. I think sometimes with contemporary texts, because you feel like, oh, I understand it, there can be a tendency to not dig as deep and as investigate so you sort of can skim over stuff um but i i think you need to do just as much work in terms of uh the lang the language and go okay well why is this character using that particular word they could use another type of word or what does that mean to them so i think it's just that we can not definitely but there could be a, a tendency to be a little lazier with contemporary writing where uh, because you think oh I get it um but actually you you have to sort of you do still have to dig deep in the or I think you do and, and look really detail and, and just even I'm fanatic about punctuation where does the punctuation where's the punctuation come in where's the full stop that's the end of that thought so where's the new thought coming from well there's a comma there so we need to uh, look at that so I I think it's just as important to be rigorous and meticulous with contemporary texts. Mm. Have you, how do you deal with like reviews of your work? Um, do you tend to, if it's a negative review, not read it or put it to one side or do you take it on board? Oh, it's really hard, isn't it? I mean, you sort of say you don't care, but then of course, the morning after press night for a show, you just go, please, I want you to love it. <laughs> please love it. Um, because you put so much work into, into plays. Um, I tend to read everything, you know, I read it and I think, I hope for the best. And I've been very lucky that I've never had anything that's been universally panned. So there's, there's, even if some people, um, with my last show in, in London, um, Beryl at the Arcola, there was, there was one review in particular that was, was particularly scathing. The, the thing that I actually got angry about was it complained about the actors' um, terrible Northern accents 
but all of my cast were from Yorkshire and one was actually three from Yorkshire and one was from Lancashire so they were all there was that they were their own accents so I just got really angry because I thought you're just wrong you know they're not putting on accents that's just how they speak um but of course you don't you can't reply <laughs> so you just have to <laughs> take it and go oh, no, it's really annoying but you can't do anything with that frustration um mm. but if as long as kind of I think as long as most people like it then then it's that's fine um and I sort of would rather have um well I'd rather obviously have all good reviews but I'd rather have loads of good reviews and a couple of stinkers than consistently mediocre I think or at least I can if I can kind of keep 80% of people entertained and happy and 20% think that wasn't for me I'd rather that than everyone going meh I was all right so um yeah that's probably how yeah how I take it but um yeah, it does. Of course it hurts when you think, oh, I want everyone to love it. <laughs> yeah, you can't win them all. You can't um, win them all. You can't win them all. Um, so coming back to sort of beginning from your time as a resident director, but even, you know, now, do you have a set approach to working with our actors on characterization or do you have to sort of vary it between their experience or their style? Yeah, it changes. I mean, it changes show to show and actor to actor, really um it's I mean the thing is when, when you're directing a professional show obviously you cast so you usually choose people they come to an audition with a point of view on a character and they go this is how I imagine playing this person so usually from the casting you get a sense of that's how that's how um they they want to interpret this this part and then you work with them to develop that and through rehearsals we'll just find what different people respond to, what different people respond to how different people like to work some people like to discuss more some people like to get straight up on their feet and explore physically um and then with training actors who i work with a lot usually there's more work involved because they are still in their training learning their own approaches so they haven't yet decided on what their own particular toolkit is um but there's not I don't have I don't have set things I always do because I, I like to mix it it's, otherwise it would be a bit formulaic so it adapts yeah it always it, it always changes and I and I also sort of cherry pick um I've just sort of like a magpie stolen you know that exercise from that book and that from that workshop I went to and that from that conversation I had so it's sort of a real um, it's a real mix of of approaches rather than I do this thing that this person wrote about or this is how I have I have developed my way of doing things so yeah it keeps it interesting changing things yeah definitely what was it like working with Maxine Peake on Beryl unfortunately I didn't really get to work with her because she um it wasn't the first production um so she wasn't around we just we got the rights and we actually end up having three productions of that well three runs of that show at different stages and the first two times we did it she was in busy in plays she couldn't come and see us and then the finally she she saw it um which I was delighted that she did and then we we were meant to meet up and and have a um have a chat but then lockdown happened so we had a lovely sort of post-mortem Skype session where we talked about it but I didn't um I didn't get to work with her sort of through it was just the, the we had the play um but actually I'm not I don't often work on new plays where the writer is in in the in the room um so I uh I think I would have also found it a bit strange for people to suddenly go, oh, and also because she's so amazing, Maxine Pink. So um, to if she was sort of there, and then also I've got the actors. At least I didn't have to worry about sort of <laughs> a, a, some kind of incredible, incredible icon. Um, I could just get on with get on with the work with the actors. Um, but she was she was amazing, and, and it was I have to you know it was terrifying. Though she'd come and see it, and you think, oh, I hope you like it because if I've done a if you think I've done a terrible job with your play um that would be mortifying but she was um she was brilliant and she uh she did enjoy it so that was that was great and then that was very rewarding to go oh thank goodness 
that your yeah. vision, your creation, we honoured it and, and you were happy with what we did. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, of course. Do you have a dream play aside from Shakespeare that you'd love to direct? Or do, have you ever thought about adapting something from a novel yourself? Yeah, I, do you know what? My dream play right now is the one that I was meant to be doing two weeks after lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, which got cancelled well I hope it might go it still go ahead so I was meant to be doing um, uh, a, a sort of comedy adaptation of uh, The Hound of the Baskervilles um, by this brilliant company who so it's not an again it's not an original uh, text they it's I can't remember now when, when it was written anyway this brilliant company did it a few years ago and I've read I read their adaptation and just thought this is amazing and um and we were lined up you know the design ready to go I'd cast it we we were meant to be starting I was meant to be starting in two weeks and then suddenly it got pulled so at the moment and and having invested already imaginatively and creatively so much thought um and knowing how I would want to do it and having cast these brilliant actors that I was desperate to work with because they were so good um, I just really hope that we we can do it. So at the moment, that's my that's my dream dream show. Um, and and one of the things I've been doing is sort of a, yeah, trying is sort of adapt, starting to adapt a novel to keep myself entertained um, during lockdown. And and hope that if the, when the theatres re reopen, that that'll be something I could sort of work on. Um, because you can't. I mean. Yes, you can. You can try and direct uh, and do things over, but but we can't really do the the work that we would normally do. So it's now just thinking, okay, while I can't do that, can I do something else? I can lay some groundwork for hopefully getting back into a rehearsal room when we can. Yeah, and you've directed in a very wide range of of spaces and theatres, um, from you know big theatres in London uh, to slightly smaller ones outside. Do you have any particular spaces that you enjoy directing in? Yeah, I really love the Rust theatres. So my favourite, I think my top, top theatre, my favourite theatre is the Swan at the RSE, which is just beautiful. Um, and and the Crucible as well. So I've not actually directed a, I've assisted on productions in the Crucible, but I haven't directed something myself in, in the Crucible space, but I would absolutely love to um, there because that relationship, the actor audience relationship in those thrust spaces is, is just completely different to, to the proscenium uh, relationship that you have. And it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's really special. And, and I think connects to, well, connects to places like, well, you know, the Globe or the, the traditional sort of Renaissance theatres that were in the thrust, they, they really understood how that connection between actor and audience worked, but also the dynamics of the space and the, your staging gets so much more interesting, I think, when you're working more, it's sort of, I'm still, of course you're still in 3D, but Cross Arch is so much flatter. Um, mm. But I think Thrust is really dynamic. So uh, yeah, so, so Thrust theatres, um, that's definitely, yeah, they're, they're my top, but I mean, they're all great. Any theatre is great, but, but the Thrust are, I think, the best. Moving then from theatrical spaces, maybe to film and television or radio, are you tempted to to t try directing in those spaces? Yeah, I mean, I really should. I think I really should be, especially at the moment, because that I think you know, TV is coming back um, very definitely faster than theatre. But honestly, I I don't. I'm not really. I might change my mind in a few years, um, but. What I love most about working in theatre is working in a rehearsal room and then the electric liveness on the night. And you do a bit of rehearsal and film, but not really. And also I can't stand when you go to film sets, um, there are all these people just hanging, there's all these people just hanging around, sort of looking really bored. And I, as an environment, because because there's there's so many there's so many elements to and there's you know people sort of it's huge and I like to have a group of people in the space all focused all of us working on the same thing and I think that when you get that going that's really really exciting um, and the, 
if you want to try something out, if you want to try a mad idea, you can try it out. It's not going to cost millions of pounds. Um, as with films, you know, you've got you're such a strict uh, timetable and, and you can't just suddenly go back if you think, oh yeah, we shot that three weeks ago, but actually I might do something different now. Whereas I have the luxury of going, oh no, let's, I've had an idea for that scene. I'm going to do it completely differently. Um, so that's, yeah, I think I'm, I'm still firmly in theatre camp. However, I might have to um, consider other mediums <laughs> if theatre doesn't come back very soon. <laughs> so never say never. In terms of your th theatrical productions then, do you have a response, do you feel that you have a responsibility to cast in like a diverse way, whether it be gender or BAME? Yeah, I think if, I think if you are in a privileged position where you are able to choose the people who are going to be involved in the production, absolutely. Um, and I think that's really important across both the actors so the sort of visible roles on stage but also in terms of the um you know your creative team as well that's really really important and i think it's very important that diversity comes in all sort of that is that means both gender and background and um for me also when i did this julia caesar for the rse um, it, was going to be, uh, it was really important to me that we also had different voices, different accents um, as well. So we ended up with uh, somebody from Wales, somebody from London, somebody from Manchester. So it just, so that you, you it enriches, um, it really enriches the work if you, if you don't have everybody looking and sounding exactly, the, exactly the same. Um, and I think if you, uh, yeah, if you're one of the the people who's in that position where you can choose who those people are it's definitely something you've got to you've got to consider and, and take into account um and yeah more work needs to be done to make sure that's make sure that's happening and certainly um i find so it's changing for sure but you know definitely a while ago you looked at all the people running buildings there weren't very many women running buildings there's still more if people think of a direct theater director on the whole it's a middle-aged man that's that tends to be it's a middle-aged white man <laughs> that's, that's it. um so luckily things are things are changing but it does sort of unfortunately these things do tend to take a bit of they do tend to take a bit of time as well and it's got to work at all levels where you go people hiring um but also the training institutions and but then down to schools where you go we need to be encouraging drama in in schools and hoping that there are drama teachers who are encouraging students to get apply to drama so it's sort of every every level every part of the ecology needs to work um work together to try and and make sure yeah we've got a range of you know all of all sorts of diversity um i think that's really really important but definitely as director if you choose if, you, if you're choosing people you've got to um yeah you've, you've got power to do something about that do you feel like not related to diversity as such but maybe a bit do you feel like the theater industry has changed since you started in it Ooh. i think there is more more of an awareness, I think, of programming that it needs to connect with the community that is around that theatre. Um, you can't just continually put on the importance of being earnest and, and hope that everyone's going to turn up. I mean, it's a great play, but um, so I think the types of work being made, the sort of voices that we're, that are being heard it feels like there's a bit of a I think there is a I think there is change I think there's definitely still there's definitely still work to be done for sure um but I think there's it's there are more conversations about that and I think that's really really good that it felt I think um now people are more open about the need for different voices to be heard and things. Whereas I think maybe a few years ago, it was just, okay, the people who run the buildings, they just choose whatever they want to do. I maybe, I sort of feel like there's, yeah, there's definitely sort of a change happening for the better, which is good. And also if you do look at the people running buildings now, um, it, that's, that's something to look more, that's not just, uh, 
that's not just white middle-aged men uh, anymore. There's, so it's, I think there is a bit of a, I think there's a bit of a change in terms of who is, who's making decisions, um, which is, a, which is only a good thing. Mm, that's really exciting. Not to bash um, white middle-aged uh, men, but just, we need that, we need that range. <laughs> we need that range. Yeah, definitely. Um, what do you think, without being too like apocalyptic, um, what do you think the future of theatre will be in a post-corona world? Oh, it's so hard because we, it relies on us being in a room together and it relies on us being close together and financially it doesn't work if you take all the seats out and the seats are two metres apart. So that's kind of scary. However, what has kept us going through lockdown is stories, reading things, watching things, film, you know, Netflix, live theatre streams, uh, well not live theatre, recorded theatre, that was what once live. Um, so I think we need, we need to be together, we need to tell stories, we need to entertain each other, we need to make each other laugh, we need to also we recognise what it is to be human beings, which is what I think theatre does. So I think the need for it and the need for community and, and those stories is, is greater than it has ever been certainly in my that I can remember um I certainly feel that I think god I just I need to sit in a room with some people and have a really really good laugh at something really really funny that's happening in front of me um <laughs> so I I think that's really good but I but I'm really desperately worried about about all the buildings that are going under and it's just getting worse because the numbers just don't add up and also I'm scared that the longer this goes on, the more scared people are going to be to come out, and and it all seems so weird to suddenly be in a in a in a tightly packed row. So, yeah, I'm 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 scared about what the future holds, but I know that it will will fight on. But at what cost? Like, how many people? How many freelancers will be gone? How many buildings will be gone? It is, we are not going to be in the same position that we were at in February 2020, and that is a real shame because it takes time to build up your theatre ecology um so but i think the need will still be there the need will be there will be there more than ever so we'll, we'll see um so we'll have some questions from the audience um so everyone that's watching please type your questions into the q a box and me and ellie will read them out and whilst we're waiting we'll ask our final question which is do you have any tv or film recommendations or even theater recommendations to fill our lockdown oh i mean i feel like all the dramas everybody's kind of watched any everybody's kind of watched the stuff like I'll only be saying things like normal people you know I'll be saying all the stuff that everybody's already everybody's already seen um but I think now is a really great time to go back and revisit like the classics the stuff that you oh you sort of look I've certainly been looking at lists of films that like you know the 100 films you sh you must watch before you die and things that I am embarrassed that maybe I've never watched and I think now I can want <laughs> to watch them um so that's I think that's sort of something I'm trying to think now what what I've, I have seen some lots of really good things during during lockdown um but of course they now don't come to mind but I'd say yeah go back like the, the sort of juicy the juicy old stuff or just the classics like actually i'm really craving one of my favorite films is some like it hot i just it's genius mm. um and so funny and so wonderful um so i think that's that's something to go back and watch i've also been watching loads of kids films like i think it's nostalgia and they're short and they are brilliantly i ended up watching like Beethoven was on Netflix and I suddenly thought oh god I haven't watched this since I was a child and it's hilarious and brilliant and the storytelling of children of stuff that's made for children is so lean and focused um it's brilliant so um yeah just sort of indulge any I think any any whim because we've got we've got the time and um um, but also, yeah, those all the sort of like the big classics that you should have watched that you feel embarrassed you should have watched. I think now's the time for that. Perfect. Thank you. 
Uh, so we have a question here from an anonymous attendee who asks, in an industry which is so dominated by white middle-aged men, how does it feel to be a woman in the industry? And do you feel like that's a question you get asked a lot? Do you know what? I don't think I do get asked it a lot, which is probably, I don't know, I don't know if that's good or if that's bad. Um, I'm certainly aware, I'm, I think it's more of my own thing, I'm aware that particularly when I'm working with older actors that I don't look like what the most of the directors that they've been directed by mm -hmm. and because actors of course they, they uh, put themselves in this really vulnerable position um, when when they're acting in, in rehearsals so they of course don't want to make a tit out of themselves and do something that they they, they don't want to do something which is bad um, and you as the director are instrumental in making sure the work is as good as it can be. So I think I feel like, and I have had this actually from a few, from a few older actors, where I maybe get tested a little bit, little bit, and it's sort of, you know, go on, are you, are you any good? Um, or I think because I look different to the directors that they've had before, I need to make sure I'm on my A game and I convince them that I have a right, I have a right to be here and I don't look like what you're used to, but I have a right to be here and I do know what I'm doing. Um, and don't worry, I will not, this, this production is going to be okay and you're not going to make you look like an idiot on stage. Um, so that's something that I've been aware of. Um, but otherwise, no, I've been, I sort of, I think actually the industry knows that there's a major gender imbalance and so on the whole the reaction is really positive if you're you're going for jobs and and you're a woman and um I think that's you know that's a that's only it's a good thing um I certainly I have never I've been really lucky I've never felt like um you shouldn't have this job because you're not a man so that's good brilliant that's yeah positive um, an anonymous attendee asks, with Shakespeare, do you find it restrictive directing plays that have already been performed so much before and have history and so many expectations? Good question. Um, no, I don't actually. I think there's just always, the plays are so brilliant. They're so much, they're so rich. Um, you, you're always going to bring something different because there's different actors and the audience is going to be different. The context in which is being performed is different and I think you could go mad if you were sort of going oh god you know somebody's played this before and what did so and so do you just need to go what what's my connection to this play what's what why do I want to do it what's interesting now um to focus on um and then do your and then do your best and sort of try not worry too much about it really I'd sort of otherwise you'll you'll go you'll go mad um but I also think, I also think you need to not fall under the trap of I'm going to do something different for the sake of being different, because that's when you can get sort of bonkers stuff that might not make any sense. Um, so being different for the sake of being different. Um, if you've got a brilliant new creative idea, fantastic, amazing. But actually, if you just go, or I try to go, I think, just, I'm just going to try and do this play as well as I possibly can. Um, without going oh we're gonna tear up the rule book and do something mental just for the sake of things um so you just then you then you'll get a much more honest um and probably a better production as well because you just go right what what does this play actually need why does it speak to me why does it speak to now um and go go that way so yeah i don't tend to i don't worry too much about, about what everybody else has done um yeah thank you uh, we've got a question here from Anna who asks, um, going back to your time when you were resident director at the Sheffield Theatres, were you ever uh, approached with a particular play which you didn't really like or didn't resonate with you and what were some of the challenges of having to direct it? Oh, good. Um, no, I, I, on the whole, I've been really lucky that the work that I have done, it's always been stuff that's really appealed to me. And I think I think that's because you seek out the work that appeals you know I wouldn't go for jobs that if I didn't like the play um I did actually once 
I once at drama school, I was offered something, I was asked about something and I said, I'm sorry, I don't like this, I, this play isn't for me. I don't think I've got a connection with this play. So I, I turned it down. Um, but generally, I think also the more work you do, people kind of get to know what sort of thing you like and what you do well. And so the sort of particular stuff comes your, your way um, that, that suits you. Um, but I think it would be very hard if I didn't have a connection to something. Um, I think I'd find it hardest if it was something somewhere that I was desperate to work at that was an amazing place. And, and then I thought, oh, I, I don't want to turn down the opportunity to work there. But I find that really difficult if I didn't have a connection to the yeah. play. So, um, yeah, so it's not been a, it's not been a, it's not been a problem, that really. That's really interesting. Um, so an anonymous attendee again says, as someone who has only ever done acting but would love to get into to try directing, um, do you have any advice for how to get those opportunities? Great question. I think uh, out of the professional directors that I worked for as an assistant, the best ones often were the ones who had been actors um, before. So uh, the brilliant Daniel Evans, um, who now runs Chichester, who's an amazing actor as well. Um, yeah, because they know what it is, you know, you know what it is to get up on stage and, and to do it. And, um, and you, so you, you get it. And then you can ask people, you know, you won't ever ask people to do anything, you wouldn't be prepared for yourself. And you know what you need to go through. So I think it's a fantastic thing if you've done acting. Um, if this person is, a, if this person is somebody who is, happens to be at Cambridge or at uni right now, just do it. You know, you'll be, I remember the first day of rehearsals, my first play that I directed, which was a May week show at the end of my first year in Cambridge. I remember these 12 faces looking at me think, going, you know, what do we do now? <laughs> but, oh God, I don't know. <laughs> just make this up. Um, and just sort of know that we're all, you know, you all just make it up to start with and that's fine. Um, and so just, uh, just try and just try and do it or if um you know people just find some willing guinea pig actor friends who would be up for spending a day with you in the rehearsal room or even maybe on zoom now that that's the new brave new world we live in um and say let's can we just explore this scene or um uh do a reading of something just try things out or run a workshop on something so just um yeah, just find and just try and find an opportunity. It's, it's harder, I, obviously, professionally, unless you become a really well-known actor and then people will just give you jobs because you're a well-known actor and they'll be like, sure, come and direct this. Um, uh, but, but just do it. Know you'll feel a bit sick inside and think, what on earth am I doing? Um, but then you'll just start doing something and you'll know either if it's working or it's not. And, uh, and don't be afraid to say, uh, sorry, that was a terrible idea. We'll try something different. Don't don't be stubborn, <laughs> because everyone will know in the room it's a bad idea. So if you try and, and plow bravely on and go, no, no, no it's great, <laughs> um, they'll know. So just be on, you know, be honest, and 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 people will forgive you that um, for sure. So um, yeah, just give it a go. And be, don't be scared to make mistakes, and just be nice to people and say thank you. And if people give you their time. Um, for free you can you know be appreciative of of that um and uh and then that will go a long way for sure perfect well i think that is all that we have time for but thank you so 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 much marika um for all of your wonderful answers and for giving us your time and thank you to everyone who joined the call and asked such brilliant questions um, please like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our next Q&A with actor, actor Whitney Kahinde on Saturday, July the 4th, 4th at 7pm. And thank you so much for joining.